start? Sure. Um, looks like Danielle is going to take us through our housekeeping. So thank you, Danielle. Yes, and they've been um, shortened slightly. So <laughs> just slightly. Uh, welcome, committee members, liaisons, and members of the public to today's eligibility and budget review committee meeting. Thank you for joining us. We are using Zoom with the goal to foster a more inclusive environment and effective meeting. If you would like to comment during the meeting, please use the raised hand feature. Please utilize this tool virtually to indicate you would like to speak in order to help the chair facilitate the discussion. A friendly reminder that this is a video conference and to please be aware of your surroundings behind you. All commission and committee meetings will be recorded and posted to the State Bar's website. Zoom captioning is also available. To enable, please select live transcript at the bottom of your Zoom screen and then select L uh, enable audio transcription. Thank you. Nicely done. Thank you. I think we're gonna take um, roll. Yes, thanks. Uh, Blakemore? Yes. McCloggy? Fightmaster? Here. King? Here. Klein? Meeker? Here. Vargas? And then I'll go through non-voting members and liaisons. Um, Judge Seligman, I don't believe is here. Um, Zach Newman from LAC. I think Zach is here. Oh, I see Zach raised his hand. Um, Selena Copeland from LAC. I'm present. And um, Melanie Snyder from the Judicial Council. I'm present. And then Laura Brown. Here. Great. Um, then I'll just go through staff. Um, I'm here. Jennifer Zelnick. Here. And Rocio Ablos. Here. Great. Um, thank you. Perfect. Thanks so much. Are we expecting any other commissioners? I, no. no. Okay, perfect. Um, so I think we're going to do um, public comment now, and then we'll provide an additional opportunity um, as, as we go through the items where um, programs might have comment as well. So is there any public comment? No one has their hands, ra hands ra hand raised. Okay, sounds good. Thanks, thanks, Kimberly. Um, so that will take us to approval of the minutes of July 14th. Um, are there any questions about the minutes? Okay, then we will, I will ask for a motion and a second. I'll move. Thank you, Angie. I'll second. Thank you, Louise. Is there any other discussion of the minutes? All in favor, aye. Uh, I'll take a. Oh, sorry, uh, right, roll call. I was on my last meeting where we do it much less formally. Thank you, Erica. No, no problem. Um, okay, O'Cloggy? Uh, Fightmaster? Yes. King? Yes. Klein? Meeker? Yes. Vargas? Blakemore? Yes. The motion carries. Okay, and I think that takes us to updates that I think Rocio is doing for us. Great. Yeah, um, quickly, sorry, just really quickly before sure. Rocio jumps into that. I did wanna note just um, since it was sort of a loose end from the last meeting to let Jim know that we checked the meeting recording from last time and we didn't need to update the meeting notes that you had joined a little bit later. Um, and that's why you weren't counted for the vote um, nice. for the meeting minutes. Great, <clears throat> thank you, Erica. Um, so I wanted to provide an, an update similar to our last meeting. Um, we There were a few adjustments needed to be made to three or organizations allocation for 2023 this current year, IOLTA EAF. Um, staff found that there were slight miscalculations when the organization submitted their application regarding their qualified expenditures. And so those slight adjustments we've um, notified of the organizations two organizations, Justice and Diversity Center of the Bar Association of San Francisco is a slight adjustment down in terms of their um, allocation, resulting in um, 3,993 less for their IOLTA allocation and 2,486 in EAF. And so we will be adjusting for that in the Q4 disbursement of the 2023 
grant um, and then updating, having them update their budget accordingly. And we will have an amendment to their existing IELTS and EAF contracts. Um, LACPA, Council for Justice is another one um, with a $684 adjustment for IOLTA and $429 for EAF. And then Wage Justice Center, um, they actually are getting a little bit more um, when we actually recalculated and, and updated their um, qualified expenditures correctly. They will be receiving $1,085 more for IOLTA and $673 more for EAF. So similar process for all three, just wanted to um, keep the committee apprised. So, Ro Rosa, that, I, I just wanna make sure I understand those were changes to the qualified expenditures for the current year? Correct. So we staff um, in reviewing and just double checking numbers um, and also, Staff came across the miscalculation and worked with staff to, uh, with the organizations to clarify or confirm um, there was a discrepancy in their application in terms of where they filled out the QEs or qualified expenditures and then the total number that was submitted in terms of the confirmed number of like this is um, our total qualified expenditures and there was a just slight discrepancy in the two. So we think it was more of just double checking when they applied. Um, a manual error. Um, and so staff since then has been working with all of the 2024 applicants to provide a little bit more TA, make sure that that doesn't happen and taking a little bit more time in, in ensuring that on the staff end, we can work with grantees so that this doesn't happen um, for next year's uh, allocation. Okay, thanks for the, thanks for the clarification. Of course. Any other, were, were, I'm sorry, were you done with your updates or? I, I was, that was okay. it. Are there any other questions from other commission members? Okay, I think we're, I think we are good. Um, so I, I don't, I, my understanding is that California Welfare Rights Organization um, was planning to make a comment about, um, about the um, item uh, 5.3. Um, and we were going to take that up first, um, but I don't know if they're here, so we should probably check about that before we take it out of order. Um, it looks like they're executive director. Yes. Um, yeah. Okay. Um, so, um, Kevin Aslanian, do yeah. you want to make a comment about item 5.3 before we begin our discussion of that? Well, do you hear me? We yes. can. Yes. Oh, okay. Yeah. Um, not really. I'm um, no. I appreciate all the work that the that staff has done, and we're working diligently to meet all the requirements, go forward, and um, and do our job. So we thank you for all your assistance, and appreciate your uh, your your help. Thank you. How's that? Is that long? <laughs> No, that it's it's fun. <laughs> if you can maybe stay on, and if as we go through this item, there's any questions, um, maybe exactly. just stay on. Yeah. People can ask you any questions they might um, they might have. That'd be great. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Okay, Erica, if we can go through that, that would be great. Yeah, let me just bring up the PowerPoint. Perfect. Thank you. Okay, um, so hopefully everybody can see that now. Um, item 5.3 is action on eligibility review conferences. Um, this year during the application cycle, we had um, one eligibility review conference with the Coalition of California Welfare Rights Organizations. Um, I'm just gonna take a minute to recap kind of the purpose of these conferences and what they hope to accomplish um, before turning it over to my colleague, Jennifer Zelnick, who will go into a little bit more detail um, about the conference itself with CCWRO. And then Jim and Louise were the committee members who participated um, in this conference. And so Jim and Louise, please feel free to also jump in at any point with additional comments or insights. But um, as I think the committee knows because we've talked about it in the past uh, couple of meetings, eligibility review conferences are an opportunity 
um, for staff of the state bar, for members of this committee, and for grantee or applicant organizations to meet um, and talk about the organization's work, um, their activities, and any questions that come up um, regarding their work, the qualifying nature of it, the organization's overall eligibility um, for grants, um, and things like that whenever there's either a, a specific concern um, about the work or if there are open questions that kind of require more discussion or more in-depth analysis to, to sort out before making an eligibility determination. Um, and so uh, when, when staff thinks that an eligibility review conference is appropriate, um, typically what we do is we'll bring it to the committee first to give you a little bit of an overview about some of the issues, um, ask for permission to schedule that. Um, then we prepare um, an outline or a memorandum with the, the main lines of inquiry or any concerns that we're seeing um, that we would recommend discussing with the organization. Um, and we meet with committee members who participate, which is typically two committee members, um, and then bring together the organization and the committee members to have that discussion. Um, it's an opportunity to have a candid discussion outside of um, a committee meeting itself. Um, and in order to have um, a more in-depth and productive discussion, that's why we do them that way. Um, and then it is uh, the working group's opportunity to, to report back to the committee in full, which is the memorandum that you received with your meeting materials is sort of the, the full analysis of, of what some of the, the questions and concerns were, as well as the working group's um, recommendations. And uh, Jennifer is gonna go into that in a little bit more depth. Thanks, Erica. Um, so once again, on July 25th, the working group held an eligibility review conference with CCWRO. Um, I'll now go over the main concerns addressed, the recommendations from the ERC, and the proposed resolution for the committee. So first, uh, the main concerns centered around internal and quality controls. One major concern stems from irregularities with CCWRO's HP2 formula and HP3 formula grants. As a note, although these grants have similar names, they are unique funding opportunities with different timelines and reporting requirements. This is particularly relevant as HP3 is a federal grant, whereas HP2 comes from state funds. Um, so staff noticed irregularities with CCWRO's HP2 and 3 formula grants in three ways. First, by conducting service reviews of all HP2 grants, also through CCWRO's May 2023 monitoring visit, and finally through CCWRO's HP3 desk audit, which is a process all HP3 grantees undergo because it is a federal grant. Through these reviews, staff found that CCWRO commingled billing and services reporting for these two grants. CCWRO had one ledger for both its HP2 and HP3 grants. It also did not separate out its services and considered the two grants one and the same. This means that CCWRO did not separate out how much time staff spent on HP2 versus HP3 work. Uh, additionally, staff found that CCWRO was billing both grants for work related to care court, um, and this does not qualify for either of the grants. A second major concern is related to internal accounting inaccuracies. CCWRO's audit was not ready on time this year, um, as I will discuss momentarily. As a result, CCWRO estimated its total corporate expenditures for its 2024 IELTA EAF application. Once CCWRO's audit was completed, State Bar staff found that its estimates about its total corporate expenditures were off by over $91,000, which is approximately 15% of its total budget. Uh, additionally, while CCWRO had approved 2022 IELTA and EAF carryovers, the approved amounts were much smaller than the actual amount of funds it carried over without approval. Staff found that CCWRO had an unapproved carryover of over $46,000 or roughly 19% of its IELTA funds, 
and over $96,000 or about 24% of its EAF funds. A third major concern is related to missed deadlines and inaccurate or incomplete reports and materials. CCWRO's past two financial audits were submitted late, and as demonstrated, its, its IOLTA EAF application for 2024 was inaccurate. Additionally, materials CCWRO submits regularly require extensive revision and staff support. Staff regularly provide CCWRO with a level of technical assistance that uh, often outweighs that provided to other organizations in order for its applications and reports to be considered complete and accurate. Uh, most recently, CCWRO missed a deadline to submit materials related to its HP3 desk audit corrective action plan. Specifically, on July 31st, CCWRO was supposed to submit documentation separating its HP3 income from HP2. Staff contacted CCWRO after the deadline to request the overdue deliverable. The following day, CCWRO stated that it completed the task, but did not include the necessary documentation to support this claim. When staff requested this documentation, CCWRO admitted that actually it had not completed the task of separating its HP3 income from HP2. Uh, next slide, please, Erica. So the following two slides are the recommendations that emerged from the ERC. Um, if CCWRO is found eligible for 2024 IOLTA NEAF funding, the working group recommends the following. Uh, require participation in a follow-up fiscal and program monitoring visit in 2024. Require submission of complete, accurate, and timely reports for all trust fund program grants. Require submission of complete, accurate, and timely documentation of successful implementation of its HP3 corrective action plan. Require submission of a complete, timely, and satisfactory response to the findings in the 2023 monitoring visit report. Require submission of a complete and accurate 2025 IOLTA and EAF application, including an audit by the May 1st, 2024 deadline. Uh, next slide, please. Recommend staff informs CCWRO's board of directors about the ERC and keeps the board of directors more informed generally. Recommend recruiting board members with a financial background and recommend hiring a part-time or full-time accountant or bookkeeper. Uh, next slide, please. So I'm happy to take any questions. Um, I'm also happy to read the resolution. Uh, I just want to make a point. Since Any I questions? The, I'm sorry, go ahead. Yeah, since I was on the, the eligibility review conference, uh, I'm particularly concerned about this because I'm also chair of the HP subcommittee. And I'm really concerned about the HP3 issue uh, because that's, we have to report those the data outcome and how we expend things to the feds because it's federal money. And uh, if it doesn't look like we can monitor federal money effectively, I, I worry about its potential for jeopardizing future future federal funding. So it's a really, really a concern for me. So uh, Jim, just uh, th thank you for uh, the concerns and for participating in the review. Um, did you have suggestions beyond what the staff was recommending that you thought we should consider or? Um, no, no, I particularly, uh, given my experience on a, on the uh, board of directors of a, a qualified legal service provider program, I think having members on the board that have a financial background so that they can provide assistance and double check on internal bookkeeping is very important. Uh, I, my, my understanding was Kevin took that suggestion in stride and hopefully they're following through with it. But um, I know it's too soon to have any new board members based on when we did the review and today, I mean, that's that's a pretty short time period. Okay, thanks. Thanks, Jim. Louise, did you have any yeah. other comments? Thank yeah. you for participating. I think, you know, I think Jim and I and the staff, I mean, we're con concerned about this. <laughs> There's been a lot of sort of trip ups along the way and missing de deadlines and whatever, but um, it's also, you know, a really good organization. So with the restrictions and the requirements we've put in place in the recommendation, I think, you know, we need to, uh, I support continuing to provide funding to them. 
with you know uh, maybe more oversight and making sure they're doing the things that we're recommending in this in this resolution. Um, it, it is has been frustrating to. Um, I looked up all the board members just for the heck of it after our last meeting, and they're all really solid, good people involved in legal services, and obviously super busy, you know, because they're executive directors of these organizations and they're spread around the state. And they're clearly good people, but I'm not, but they're not, I don't think people who really need to be keeping an eye on this organization. So having the inside um, financial people, I think is critical. Okay, thanks, Louise. Do other commission members have any um, questions? Okay, I and, and if not, I had a couple that I could, we just take a minute to ask. Um, there was a reference to care court and I wasn't, Quite understanding that because care court isn't even in effect yet. So could you just say more about that? Sure. So through the HP2 um, and three services reviews, staff saw that um, CCWRO was reporting having done work with its HP2 and three grants related to care court. Um, there is a very small window of work that could qualify under the homelessness prevention grants that would be related to care court. Um, mm -hmm. But after a thorough review and discussion with CCWRO, staff asserted that the work that CCWRO had completed was not qualifying. This included things um, like creating a guide on how to um, uphold care court participants' procedural rights that are clearly not related to homelessness prevention. So um, CCWRO has agreed to back out that non-qualifying work, and we are in the process of working with them to determine the amount of funds and whether it come, what percentage comes from HP2 and what percentage comes from HP3. Um, but it was a concern because Obviously, those activities are not only non-qualifying, but they weren't activities uh, for which CCWRO applied in its respective HP2 and 3 applications. Okay, thanks. Thanks for that. And then sure. you referenced the deadline of June 31st, and I think you said you had not received the materials. So Correct. it's now, you know, the 10th of uh, the 10th of August. Have you received them by now or there's we have not? You They're still not. pending. Um, yesterday, we received an email from CCWRO stating that there were some issues uh, related to their accountant, uh, perhaps a surgery and a hospitalization uh, of the accountant. But I think staff are concerned because CCWRO initially stated that they did complete the deliverables and they have since retracted that. Uh, so that's that's a concern. Okay, and my my last um, comment is there's a number of recommendations. I I, I think all the all the uh, requirements that you put in place, but I notice that a couple are like recommend that they add a board member with an accounting background. There's another recommend. Uh, I guess I'm I'm trying to distinguish like is it really just a recommendation and the organization can choose how it wants to proceed or is it intended as a requirement um because i think those are kind of two different two different approaches i suppose sure i agree um and perhaps erica if you mind going back to the previous slide so these three are the recommendations um and i think the first recommendation is more feasible if the committee wanted to make it into a requirement but um in terms of recruiting board members with a financial background and hiring a part or full-time accountant or bookkeeper, uh, I think that from, from staff's perspective, it's a little bit difficult to require those within um, a specific time frame as those, uh, you know, we, we, we don't know the feasibility of them recruiting uh, those members or hiring uh, because we don't, we don't want to necessarily assert that level of um, financial control and, and what it would mean for the organization to have to hire a new staff. Um, but we have expressed our strong recommendation for those. Um, and also, of course, the committee 
could decide to change the language around them as it sees fit. Okay. Um, at least from my perspective, hearing what you said, I, I think it's important and consistent with the guidelines we have that staff inform the board of directors, not that we're just recommending that you do that. So I, I personally think that should um, be changed, but of course, um, interested in other committee members. And I, I guess the second thing before we go to Angie is after we hear staff comments, I guess I'm interested in hearing from um, Kevin Aslanian about kind of the, the delays when something was promised and the information's still not there and sort of what some, some explanation that, that we can, can hear about uh, when the bar should expect things because one of the findings was related to delays in, in producing um, materials. So with that, I'll turn it to Angie. Uh, my question is kind of related to the extent of our authority and jurisdiction. What Can we get that enmeshed in the internal workings of some agency? I mean, how far does the bar have rights to put their fingers in the day-to-day -day stuff? That bothers me to require that they recruit a member with a financial or requires they get a bookkeeper. I mean, I, it, obviously a really good idea. And I agree, I guess it was Jim that earlier said it helps to have a board with a lot of financial because that's been a situation I've been part of as well. So I strongly recommend, but I don't think we can require it. Yeah, Angie, I was just suggesting that the first one after the explanation be um, changed from a recommendation, but I do think the trust fund should notify the board of directors and keep the board informed about the status of things. So that was the only one I was suggesting. But that's change. part of the staff's responsibility to the board anyway. It, it is. And I, to me, it's just a piece of oversight, but we all get to vote on that. So I was just trying to be clear. I wasn't, re I wasn't changing the second and third bullet to require. All right. Thank you. Uh-huh. Um, other, other comments, um, I guess could, if Kevin's still on the phone, I guess it would be helpful to sort of understand the status of the materials that were due on July 31st and when the bar can expect to receive them. Yes, I'm here. Do you hear me now? Sure can. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. So first of all, I should say that, uh, I'm sorry, but, uh, that report that was due on the 31st. I thought I emailed it out, but apparently it didn't go out. So I emailed it out on August the 2nd. And if you look at that, if staff looks at that report, that also report went to the board. So we keep the board informed of what we're doing. So everything that we send to the state bar, we also we make a report to the board so they know on each recommendation and and I mean and, and what we and and what the status is. In regards to the, when, when they first told us that you have to have a ledger, uh, we were in the impression, under the impression that it's prospective ledger, not retroactive. So the, consul uh, the, ca um, the consultant right away created a ledger for HP2 or HP3 and figured it would be populated uh, past July 1 of this year. And then we find out that that had to be retroactive, which is fine. Um, and we told the, account, the consultant that you have to start migrating stuff into the ledger. And then she got sick. So, um, and we are working um, to get that done. We're also looking for uh, assistance in a full-time or part-time accountant or firm to help us with this. Uh, we're also rec uh, working on recruiting a board member who has uh, who's an accountant or an uh, accountant background. So we're trying to do all of that stuff. Is that responsive? So so thank you. So it sounds like from your perspective, you've provided a report. It's a little unclear to me if the bar actually received that or not and that there's some distinction between creating ledgers for going forward. And now there's an understanding that those also have to be done re retroactively. And is there a date by which you think, I understand the person got sick, but is there a date by which you expect that to be done? 
I think uh, Jennifer, if I'm not mistaken, I said, yeah, we need, um, she's still in the hospital. So when she gets out, so we may need 30 days to get that done, but we, we're we working on it. I mean, I, I can't do it, okay? I mean, so we have to have an accountant to do it. And she's in the hospital. And we also try to recruit other people to help us with this. So we're trying our best to get it done as, far, as, as soon as possible. Um, so can I provide a little clarification to that? Uh -huh. Kevin is correct. On August 2nd, uh, we did receive a report from CCWRO that was sent to their board that stated that the deliverable that was due on July 30, 31st had been completed. However, what is missing, again, is the deliverable. Um, and what I'll say is while staff are very sympathetic to illness and injury, and we want to work with CCW, CCWRO, um, they submitted their corrective action plan on June 30th, and staff have reviewed it, and um, CCWRO stated that the majority of the deliverables that the HP Funds Committee needs in order to make a decision would be completed by August 15th. So staff have communicated several times with CCWRO to impress upon it that we really need those deliverables to be completed by that date in order to make a decision. Um, and in our most recent communications, staff were told again that we would receive those deliverables by August 15. So this is kind of new information for us that we're hearing now. Um, so I think we'll need to have a further discussion about what this means for um, for HP funds and how we can uh, move forward with making a decision there. Um, but but that's just to confirm that yes, uh, they did CCWRO did submit a report on August second about the July thirty first deliverables, but we still do not have those deliverables. Okay, so there are two pieces. One piece is the ledger two and the ledger three, that we were supposed to get to you by July 31. The other piece for August 15th are the corrected time cards. And those, we will have it to you when the final stages of completing those, and that will be uh, 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 given to you. What we what, the delay is the one for July 31. So August 15th, we will be delivering that on time, which are the time card, revised time cards for three staff members. Is that correct? Uh, that, that sounds correct. Um, and, and thank you for clarifying. Okay. Okay, so um Th thanks for the information. And it looks like there might be a comment. Was there a comment from the LA conference room? Your light went on temporarily. So no, no, I don't think so. Okay. Might have been papers wrestling or something. Um, okay, we have us we have staff. Um, do you want to look at the resol resolution? And do committee members have any recommendations for changes to the resolution? And Jim and Louise, I think I I at least would appreciate you know your your sense of the the resolution and if it's good to go or whether we want to make any changes. I think you've been appropriately involved in 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 the review. It looks good to me. Okay. Angie seems okay with it. Louise, I think is reading it still. No, I was trying to get my mute off. Um, it looks fine to me. I mean, I think the further resolved is what's what's really important is that this is like this is a warning sort of last chance time. And you know what it's really hard with these organizations that are so I mean, they're all really busy, but that some of the pieces just don't get done right and they have to get done right. I mean, there's no question about that. But as long as I've been on this committee, we've been I've never seen them just say no. I mean, it's basically corrective action and um, and it happens. So I'm fine with this. Um, I think that last paragraph in particular uh, 
makes me more comfortable because you know it's got some teeth in it. And then I, um, Erica or Jennifer. So the last piece, which says um, that there would be a formal warning to the uh, CCWRO. And if they fail to comply with the conditions imposed, then the trust fund commission may pursue any of the remedies. Does that come back to the trust fund commission or does this give the authority to staff to do something? Can you just maybe clarify for us what the next steps would be if there was not compliance with the conditions? Yeah, um, if, if there was a lack of compliance, it would be something that would follow sort of the same order that it has through this process, it would come back to the committee level um, to discuss whether, you know, any other additional conditions or impact on their grant award is warranted, um, then that would go to the full commission for a decision. So it, it's not empowering staff to do anything without the continued advice and guidance of the committee and commission. Great. Thank you. Are there any other comments about the resolution? And if not, is there a motion? I'll move. Thank you, Jim. Is there a second? I'll second. Louise, thank you. Um, any other discussion, questions? And if not, um, Erica, do you want to call the roll? Um, Akwagi? Fightmaster? Yes. King? Yes. Klein? Maker? Yes. Vargas? Blakemore? Yes. The motion carries. I'm sorry, I missed the, um, I was switching to my vote tally, the, the motion in the second. It was Jim and- uh, um, Louise. Oh, Jim and Louise. Thank you. You're welcome. Okay, I think we are done with item 5.3. Um, appreciate the two commissioners that participated in the review and to Kevin Aslanian for participating in today's um, meeting. And I think we will go back um, to the other items on the agenda. So we have 5.1. Great, thank you. Um, so just a, um, a quick update on Sport Center deeming results. Um, if you're not familiar with the deeming process, um, basically uh, under the IALTA statute, sport centers that didn't exist prior to December 31st, 1980, um, there's a provision that they have to be deemed of special need by a majority of the legal services projects in order to continue to receive funding. Um, so the way that our office has implemented that is on a rotating three-year basis. Um, so any support center that needs to be deemed, if they've been deemed, say this year, they won't be up for voting again for the next three years. Um, and that's really just based on when they obtained their original eligibility. Um, so we send out ballots to um, all of the legal services projects that are currently receiving funding um, and ask them if they would deem the relevant organizations of special need. Uh, they need to receive a majority vote in order to be considered deemed. Uh, this year we had Family Violence Pellet Project, uh, Impact Fund, and Legal Services for Prisoners with Children um, that needed to be, uh, be voted upon. Um, and so we received 60 of 79 votes. Um, when an organization doesn't submit a vote, we, we let them know that it's counted as a no vote. Um, but um, despite that, um, out of you know, the, the 79 organizations, the, all three uh, support centers received a majority vote. So um, they have all been deemed um, and are considered um, eligible you know, assuming that they also comply with all the other um, application requirements. So um, any questions about the, the process or voting? Yeah, I have a question. Sure. Yeah, when uh, I was reviewing the stuff for CCWRO, I thought I read somewhere that it was came into existence after 1980. And I was wondering why it's not on the list of ones that have to be deemed. Somebody said something along the line that it was grandfathered in, but I don't understand the grandfathering process and why was it grandfathered in? Yeah, um, so it's uh, my understanding that a number of years ago, um, this came up with the commission and it was before my time. So I unfortunately don't have all of the details, but um, 
looks like Selena might have some more information, but my understanding is um, that there was a process for some organizations that maybe existed, but not in their current form prior to 1980. There was um, a decision to, yes, essentially grandfather them in as having existed prior to that date. And so they're, they're not subject to the deeming process, but um, Selena, I see your hand raised. So if you have more information about that, please feel free to jump in. Well, just a tiny bit of additional info is that um, at some point in time, I think it was the earliest rules revision process, we wanted to look to see when support centers were incorporated. And it was um, heavily discussed and heavily memoed. And so if any current commissioners wanted to look at that, I'm sure it'd be easy to find the memos. But every organization um, had to show that they were in existence during that time. And some of them had a different name. And some of them had... Um, it existed as part of another project, but then they incorporated, but it was it was heavily discussed and um, boards got involved. And so I, I feel confident that if, if they are grandfathered in that it's um, was researched by state bar staff back at that time. Okay, thanks, thanks, Selena. The, Go ahead, the other question I have is why is a no vote, why is a, a, a non vote considered a no vote? Erica, if you're talking, I think we can't hear you for some reason. Um, can you hear there me? There you now? go. Yes. Yep. Um, I, I think that was sort of an, an expediency provision that if an organization chooses not to vote, the assumption is that they don't deem the organization of special need. Um, uh, we do have a, a process for organizations to abstain. So if they wanted to abstain, they could actually register that through their ballot. Um, and if you abstain, then it's not counted in the vote count. Um, but for those that choose not to respond, we send out several reminders. We send out a number of, you know, a memo at the beginning, information about these organization services. Um, we encourage programs to vote. So um, if they don't respond, it, it's assumed that um, they chose to do it. So, um, so, so that's why um, it's considered a no vote. And we do we disclose that to both the sports centers and the legal services projects when we send out the ballot. Like if you don't respond, this is how it will be interpreted. And so they're informed on that level as well. Are there any other questions or comments about 5.1? Okay, there's no action for us to take. This was just information. Correct. So why don't we move on to 5.2? Um, so 5.2 has to do with our, our new applicants um, for IL-10 EAF funding. So these are organizations that have either never, never applied before or are not currently receiving funding. Um, and I'm sure as you all recall, we went through impact litigation and advocacy work activities earlier this year with the committee for existing grantees. Um, when we have a new applicant, uh, they haven't had the opportunity to complete those reports um, prior to the application process. So for them, it is part of the application review itself. Um, and, you know, just a reminder that uh, for an ILA activity to be considered qualifying work, the legal services project would need to demonstrate that it, it's having an impact or a benefit for a majority indigent population um, or a disproportionate impact or benefit um, for indigent persons, which um, is something that the committee has allowed in the past and is also now incorporated in uh, the new rule um, that went into effect in July. Um, so we had 10 new applicants this year. All of them were legal services projects. Um, seven of those reported some amount of ILA activities. Um, so we had 45 total, 23 of those were impact litigation cases and 22 were advocacy activities. Um, there were a few activities that were voluntarily marked non-qualifying by the organization, and after consulting with staff, um, they determined the amount of expenditures related to those activities and deducted it on their applications, so there was no, no disagreement or dispute there, um, and it was already acknowledged, so that's been handled. And then of um, the remaining 41 activities during staff's review, 38 of those were were clearly qualifying to us, um, given those uh, parameters of needing to impact a, a majority indigent population. Um, and then there were uh, three activities that 
um, rather than benefiting a majority of indigent persons, it, it demonstrated disproportionate impact. And uh, the nature of those activities was that it was primarily benefiting workers throughout the state, um, but the organization that did that work um, sort of detailed how their advocacy is uh, both informed and initiated by their work direct services with clients. Um, and they were advocating for things like, you know, ensuring unemployment insurance and paid family leave or helping with wage recovery after uh, wage theft um, and highlighted how the fact that this could help any worker, um, it, it's still the case that it would be particularly helpful to, to low wage workers um, or low income workers. And so um, staff still felt that those activities should be considered qualifying. So, so our recommendation is that um, that the committee approve um, all the activities that were reported by these new applicants, all their new ILA activities as qualifying with the exception of the ones that have already been, as I mentioned, acknowledged and, and deducted in the application. Are there uh, questions or comments from mission members about about this item or the resolution? Okay, I'm not hearing any. So is there a motion to, a motion uh, regarding the resolution? I'll move. Thank you, Angie. Is there a second? I'll second. Thank you, Louise. Is there any other discussion or question? Okay, and if not, we will um, do a vote. Foggy? Fightmaster? Yes. King? Yes. Klein? Meeker? Yes. Vargas? Blakemore? Uh, yes, and just one one question. There's no organization that anyone needs to abstain from because we, I don't, I'm not recalling the name of the or, the ten new organizations. Oh, I apologize. Um, I can read those out if um, if anybody thinks they might have a conflict, um, or if you just to confirm. Would that be helpful? Um, I think maybe just. Thank you. Yeah, um, the 10 new organizations are Al Otro Lado Incorporated, um, the California Collaborative for Immigrant Justice, the Center for Immigrant Protection, the Center for Workers' Rights, the Elder Law and Disability Rights Center, Immigrant Defenders Law Center, Immigrant Legal Defense, um, CUME Place Incorporated, Santa Barbara County Immigrant Legal Defense Center, and the Southern California Immigration Project. So Erica, I guess my question is, I think three of those organizations receive um, innovation and infrastructure grants from the Access Commission. Um, mm -hmm. Is there a reason that I need to abstain for that purpose? Um, hmm. I so I it was the first two, and okay. maybe the fifth one. I think the the one I had elder or something in it. Elder Law and Disability Rights Center. So maybe that one. I'm not really positive, but why don't I just abstain for those three, and maybe we can for the future just ask uh, for an opinion about it. it. Won't change. It won't affect the vote. So, um, thank you for uh, noting that, Catherine. Yep. Sorry, to think about it earlier. That would have been more helpful. No problem. Um, okay. So let me. Go back to sharing my screen. Perfect. Five point four. Um, yeah. So um, five point four and five point five uh, sort of deal with with similar sort of outstanding eligibility potential eligibility issues. So possible non qualifying activities or just eligibility issues generally. 
Um, we had mentioned in the memorandum that uh, staff recently had a couple monitoring visits with two support centers, um, Youth Law Center and Legal Services for Prisoners with Children. Um, during our review of the documents for those visits, as well as additional conversation with the organizations, um, it revealed some possible non-qualifying work by those organizations. Um, uh, it has been a little bit challenging to sort of tease out at this point the extent of some of the non-qualifying activities because they do tend to be part of much more large scale projects or more complex projects where some of the work is qualifying and some may not be. Um, and so we're at a point where we're obtaining more information from the organizations and we're confident that we will get the information that we need. Um, it's really just a matter of timing because these visits happened so recently we haven't had a chance to sort of finally resolve that uh, before the end of the application review period. So our recommendation given that because of the timing was, was for the committee to recommend both Youth Law Center and Legal Services for Prisoners with Children is eligible, contingent on them continuing to work with us as they have been uh, to identify and deduct non-qualifying activities. Um, and I think you know the important thing to, to note is that with support centers, even if there are additional non-qualifying activities identified um, that they would need to deduct, say, in a future application or even going retroactively to this year's application, um, it would not impact their, their 2024 grant award. Support centers under the funding formula receive the same allocation, uh, no matter the size or sort of the amount of their qualified expenditures. And so as long as they've demonstrated a primary purpose, they receive the same award no matter what. Um, and you know, at this point, we don't necessarily anticipate that it would impact primary purpose either for these organizations. Um, Youth Law Center, when they completed their application, initially it was at 100%, so we don't think that this would bring them below 75%. Um, and legal services for prisoners with children are um, close to the 75% the line, um, but they also, some of the activities that are non-qualifying have already been acknowledged and taken out, and so we don't know how much more there is, but in the event for some reason it fell below 75% uh, for that presumption, we would certainly update the committee, but what we know about the organization and its work and its longstanding receipt of grants, we would still recommend them as meeting primary purpose. So, so staff is not particularly concerned in that respect either. <coughs> so and, our, that was our, our proposal would be to, to recommend them as eligible just with the understanding that they're going to continue to work um, with staff to, to sort out these non-qualifying expenditures and then um, again, if if any updates are necessary regarding the primary purpose piece, we'll be happy to bring that back to the committee at its November meeting. So Erica, just to refresh my memory, my, my recollection is that if an organization, a support center or a qualified legal services program falls below the 75%, there can still be a sort of qualitative analysis of the organization yeah. in addition to a quantitative analysis and yeah. that the bar has been flexible in how that and how that works, right? That yeah, perfect. yeah. I mean, it, it's similar to the. Um, I believe we did this at the at the last meeting um, that the committee looked at sort of that narrative explanation and and made that uh, determination that you know maybe not quantitatively meeting that seventy five percent mark, but um, based on the organization's um, explanation of why they fell below that mark and uh, general understanding of their operations, um, how they still meet the primary purpose uh, requirement under the statute. So, um, and so that, that's what we're saying. We either think it, it won't impact their primary purpose or if for some reason it did, based on what staff knows about these organizations at this point, we would still recommend them um, as meeting primary purpose and we could bring that additional uh, sort of qualitative analysis back to you at your next meeting. Thank, thanks so much for that um, explanation, really helpful. Okay, um, any, any other, is there a resolution? There's nothing we need to take action on right now, right? Uh, we no, we had sort of folded it into the ultimate recommendation on eligibility, um, but obviously if you want to take it separately when we reach that point, you can do that. Okay, so why don't we just go ahead and we'll do the resolution all at once or take them one by one, if, depending on, are there any other comments or questions from commission members? Not seeing any. 
Okay. Ella, you're a little hard for us to see. So wave at us or put a hand up or something if if there's something you want to say. Um, okay. Um, okay, let's go on to the next item. We're making such good progress. Um, so this is actually um, the item related to, to overall eligibility for 2024 um, grants for IELTA and Equal Access Fund uh, formula grants. Um, so we had 110 applicants this year, um, which is great. Uh, we currently have about 100 uh, um, grantees. So um, this is a substantial increase in terms of our number of applicants and potential grantees. Um, 100 returning, 10 new. Um, the breakdown, um, uh, uh, you know, between uh, legal services projects and support centers is that 89 of the applicants are legal services projects and then 21 are support centers. Um, so all of the new applicants fell into the legal services project um, grouping. Um, for any of the new applicants that might be found eligible in 2024, um, we did just want to remind you that we always conduct monitoring visits with new applicants in the first year. Um, and so um, we would have, um, you know, additional information on, on those grantees uh, to report back to the committee. And um, it's an opportunity for staff to provide additional guidance as these new grantees get used to um, receiving uh, state bar grants and complying with the new um, requirements. Um, we, of, of, those, of those 10 new applicants, just did kind of want to note sort of, uh, I believe seven out of the 10 are primarily um, immigration legal services providers. So um, there was definitely a large contingent focused on immigration legal services. Um, and then uh, workers' rights, disability rights, um, and veterans legal services were sort of the other uh, main practice areas. Um, Selena, I see that you have your hand raised um, if you wanted to jump in on that. Oh yeah, just a very quick question. Um, <clears throat> I know you say 100 are returning and I was curious if there was a list available for commissioners around the organizations that chose to not apply um, and it's okay if it's not in this meeting, because sometimes I've heard that organizations don't apply because they can't get their um, audit in time, or there's a very um, easy reason that LAC is, is happy to help. And I've provided some technical assistance to programs who dropped out for a year and trying to get them to, to be back in. So I just want to know if there's any, any way that we could help or if commissioners could have a quick summary of why anyone dropped out. Sure. Um, I don't have that right in front of me, so this might be anecdotal, but um... We didn't have any any that at this point who chose not to sort of reapply. We did have a couple organizations. Um, there was one in particular that they were eligible for for funding this year actually, and they declined their award um, early in the year. And so I guess they would probably fall into that category. And my understanding was they were either winding down operations or just significantly cutting back and restructuring. Um, and so they didn't feel that they had the ability to. Um, comply with all of, say, like the, the quarterly expenditure reports and evaluations and in comparison to the size of, <clears throat> of the grant award that they were receiving. So um, is that the one we learned about earlier in the year? I think they did like IEP advocacy or something. Yes. Um, IEP I think we talked about them um, previously, actually. Yes, and they did say, in case helpful, um, that they would love to reapply in the future um, once they're able to. I think they were considering shifting to a volunteer model for the near future, but would really appreciate learning about um, the process, what it takes to be a trust and program grantee, um, and may reapply in the future. Thanks for the info, Rocio. Selena, did that answer your question? Okay, Thank, thanks so much, Erica. Yeah, and um, to the extent that we do have, um, if anybody else were, um, say, in this coming year to decline their award or say that they were not going to reapply for any reason, I, um, it's helpful to know about that additional support. And so feel free to reach out to, to us to talk about it as well. Um, and we'll continue to give those updates like we did with IEP Collaborative. So. And I think there uh, at least ma the materials do show who the 110 um, grantees are and the, and the funding amounts, as I recall. So yeah. thanks for that. Yeah. Um, 
And then um, Rocio, I don't know if you had any other info you wanted to share about new applicants that um, that I maybe overlooked that you thought was important. No, I think you did a good job. Thank you. Sure. Um, so um, staff is recommending all 110 applicants as eligible. Um, you know, with with the caveats or the contingencies that we previously discussed, uh, for example, related to CCWRO um, or the, the two instances with Youth Law Center and Legal Services for Prisoners with Children um, making the appropriate deductions as we continue to work with them. So, um, so that would be built into the recommended motion. Um, after voting on this, the next steps would be to take it to the full commission this afternoon for a final determination on eligibility. Um, and then staff will spend the next week and a half to two weeks running the funding formula and um, determining tentative allocation amounts based on the formula. Um, once we release those, grantees will have about a month to complete the budgeting process and submit their budgets uh, prior to the committee's next meeting in November. And the budget, when are the, can you just remind us when the budgets are due? <clears throat> uh, September 22nd. Okay, thank you. Um, and then my other comment was my recollection is that when you do monitoring visits that commission members, if they have time, could participate in those. So I just wanted if, if that's still the case, I just wanted to flag that if people were interested in any of the new organizations or wanted to participate, I assume they would let like you, Erica, know or something like that. So um, just an yeah. opportunity to learn about some of the new new grantees or or current grantees that would be in the three-year cycle. Absolutely. Yeah, um, we definitely continue to encourage um, commission and committee members to participate in monitoring visits if you're available. Um, currently, we're still doing those remotely by Zoom. So, um, you know, if that uh, makes it a little easier to participate, that's that's one option. Um, and yeah, especially with, with newer organizations to get to know them a little bit better. Um, you're welcome to join us. I believe um, all commission members have access to Smart Simple, but if you're not familiar with using it or logging in, you you can always email me um, and and indicate your interest, and we'll be sure to follow up with you when you're we're ready to schedule. And I will be providing a brief update on monitoring visits at the full commission meeting this afternoon, and I can add that just a reminder for the full commission that they are able to join and to let us know if there's interest as we start mapping that out for 2024. That would that would be great, Rocio. Thank you for that. And thanks for the, um, the additional information, Erica, about how that how that works. Appreciate it. Yeah. Any other comments or questions about IOLTA EAF eligibility? OK. Um, and do we have do we have one more? No, we have a resolution now, right? Which takes yeah. up both of the two things that we discussed. Okay. Um, do you want to read the resolution? Is yeah, sure. I'd be happy to. Um, so the the proposed resolution it has two parts. Um, the first part is resolved that the eligibility and budget review committee recommends to the Legal Services Trust Fund Commission 110 applicants as eligible for 2024 IELTA EAF funding as reflected in attachment A to the August 10th, 2023 meeting memorandum. And it is further resolved that the Eligibility and Budget Review Committee recommends California Coalition of Welfare Rights Organizations, Legal Services for Prisoners with Children and Youth Law Center is eligible contingent upon their continued work with staff to resolve issues raised during this year's application and eligibility review process prior to next year's application. Are there any questions or comments about the resolution? Okay, if not not seeing any, is there a, mo a motion? I'll move. Thank you, Jim. Is there a second? I'll second. Thank you, Angie. I also have a question. This is where we recuse ourselves as to the individual or, okay. Thank yes. you. Thank you for asking, yes. Um, I can take roll if there's no other discussion. It's like we're good for that. Great. Um, a cloggy? Uh, fight master? Yes, but abstain as to Law Foundation of Silicon Valley and Legal Aid of Sonoma County. Thank you. 
Um, King? Yes, and abstain as to San Luis Obispo Legal Assistance Foundation. Uh, Klein, Meeker? Yes, abstain as to Public Law Center. Uh, Vargas and Blakemore. Uh, yes, and abstain as to Disability Rights California and the three organizations I mentioned before. Uh, the motion carries. Perfect. Thank you. And thanks to the staff for all your careful review of all the applications. I saw clearly a lot of work involved in that. So we, we appreciate all of you that, that did that. So I think we're on to um, 5.7. Yes. Um, so um, Rocio and I'll uh, cover this item. Um, regarding 2024 budgeting guidelines. Um, so um, as you all may recall, the commission recommended back in June um, and I held the distribution in 2024 of a little over 95 million. Um, this was approved by the board of trustees in July um, and it, it represents an 88% increase over the current year's awards. Um, so it's a very substantial increase to funding. Um, the discussion at the commission's meeting in June was, was to recommend a two year spend down period. Um, but there had also been additional comments that if a longer spend down period were, were possible that there would be interest in that um, potentially given just how, how large of an increase um, in funding it is. And so since that uh, June meeting staff has done some research about the possibility of say having a three or a four year spend down, uh, we also, sent out a grantee survey um, a couple of weeks ago regarding grantee preferences to confirm that a longer spend down would be a benefit to the grantees that they're interested in that, um, as well as whether they have the infrastructure in place to um, accomplish the necessary reporting and to, to keep track of the funds over that long of a period of time. Um, so uh, based on our research and based on the results of the survey, um, the, the recommendation that we're making today is for um, to actually recommend an, a four-year spend down period for 2024 funds. Um, EAF funds didn't, didn't increase substantially for 2024, so that would still be a one-year uh, spend down period. So this would be just for IELTA having uh, a four-year period to spend the funds. Uh, the important thing to note is that all of the 2024 funds would go out next year. So the distribution would occur within one year um, it would just be at the grantee's option to spend over the four years. Um, it's at their discretion how quickly or slowly they want to spend. So if they have the ability to spend all their funds in one year, that's fine. They do it in two years, also fine. It's really up to them um, and they would have the funds on hand to be able to make that decision. Um, it's also important to know though that there will be additional installments or, or distributions in subsequent years. So if they still have funding left over from 2024 in 2025, they're still going to get a, a 2025 grant award as well. Um, and so that's sort of the, the main thing to, for grantees and, and staff and the commission to be mindful of is the um, continued spend down um, while there's a new influx of money each year. So uh, that's one thing I think we'll sort of be keeping an eye on um, over the course of that time. Uh, the other main recommendation besides the four year spending period uh, is to adjust quarterly expenditure reports to a semi-annual basis, um, given that the funds could be spent over a period of four years, um, it seemed more appropriate to allow grantees to, um, to, to not have to complete so many reports when we can get the same information um, sort of on a more um, intermittent basis. But um, yeah, Rocio, did you wanna add anything about that? That's great. Thank you. Yeah, just to add a little bit more about the grantee survey, um, we're thankful how, uh, about how many organizations actually replied um, within a short time frame. But we wanted to have that input, and just as Erica mentioned, to confirm that you know what we assumed would be helpful or additional flexibility that grantees wanted um, did align with what we were considering and researching. And so we had about 70 um, organizations reply to the survey. And overwhelmingly, there was either support or strong support for the four-year spend-down flexibility. Um, interestingly, um, so I would say about 
over 75% were either in support, strongly supporting um, the four-year spend down. Um, but we did offer an opportunity to provide additional, more detailed feedback um, in comments, um, whether they would opt in as an individual organization uh, for additional years. And we did in the comments um, hear back what we expected, that it will vary. Some organizations um, are in favor of it if it's helpful for others, but they themselves may not um, you know, use the four-year spend down. Others are really looking forward and excited about what it could do for um, their hiring and staffing plans. Um, so I don't think there's there's anything very surprising there, but it sounded like very appreciative of the uh, committee and commission exploring this additional flexibility given the, the large increase in the funding. Um, and then on the reporting piece, so just to um, just to confirm that we're not proposing to change what we collect. Um, the expenditures would still be tracked on a quarterly basis. Um, just we're looking at the frequency of those reports and the deadlines that they'd have to manage and the staff would also follow up on. So rather than submitting quarterly expenditures on a quarterly basis, they'll be the, the proposal is quarterly expenditures would be submitted twice a year. And staff would like to continue exploring further um, the reporting piece and bring that back to um, this committee at its next meeting. But for now, we thought these were two um, proposals that aligned with what the committee um, and commission wanted us to explore and what we were hearing from grantees that would be helpful. Do people have questions? Uh, yeah, I have a number of questions. I happen to also be on the rules committee and the we we're discussing the issues of carry forwards versus rollovers and the terminology involved. And what I'm concerned about is we're, if we're allowing them to budget this stuff out, not just merely take money that hasn't been spent in year one and roll it over into non-committed uh, reserves, let's say, um, as opposed to we're budgeting this money to spend over the next four years on issues of staff money, or, or, or salaries, and that if they're not meeting that, that we catch them and if they just don't allow to accumulate this to have an uncommitted uh, surplus. Uh, because uh, I know Rich Rhinus is no longer on the committee, but I know he was always concerned that the legislature and they allocate money for a particular year that is that be expended on access to justice, and legal services for that year, not to allow programs to use this to accumulate reserves. So when you say semi-annual, what does that mean? One, one time a year that it's gonna be looked at? Twice a year, an excellent question. And this brings me to a couple of things that we were staff um, considering in terms of what that four-year spend down would look like. Again, not everyone would opt into it, um, but for those that would, um, that it would be the budget that they would be submitting um, before the next commission meeting would be cumulative, given that we will disperse all funds in 2024, and some grantees could, you know, opt to spend down just within that one year, um, but to collect projections for year one, and then potentially what we're exploring that we'd want to bring back to the committee at the next meeting is potentially building in, um, so if we are moving to the semi-annual reporting, so there would be one after like the first two quarters. At the end of that first full year, we might add on a projection for year two to give us an opportunity to check, you know, what was spent that initial year. If there are funds that are um, that are remaining and they're opting to spend in additional years, to project kind of on an annual basis, so that we could still track um, not just against what was spent, but also what they're projecting how how they're proposing to spend that. So if any um, if there are any flags that we bring that back to the committee but allowing enough flexibility for those that may, you know, spend down completely after year one or year two um, or year three and four. So still exploring that a little bit, but that's what we're thinking we may um, come back to the committee and, um, and propose in terms of the reporting requirements. So Rosu, just picking up on Jim's comment, because I, I think I heard the question a little bit differently, which is when you submit a budget for IOLTA, are you doing a four-year budget that shows how those funds will be spent over that four-year period of time? Or is the expectation you're doing a one-year budget and you're showing 
three quarters of your grant as essentially a carry forward, but not yet allocating how it's spent? At, at the moment, what staff is thinking is that it would be a cumulative budget, so it wouldn't be broken down. They wouldn't necessarily have to. We could change that the committee um, thinks that we, we should move in that direction, but um, have a cumulative budget um, for the entire the entire amount and then to project for year one. So we'd be able to see if they're thinking of, um, of spending some after year one, knowing to Jim's point that the rules committee is currently um, considering and looking at potentially pulling IOLTA out of um, the current uh, process for carryovers, considering rollovers and budget modifications. So allowing that flexibility so that we don't create something separate from what the rules committee working group is currently working on. Okay, I, I'm sorry, I'm still confused. So it is a one-year budget for potentially a quarter Correct. of the expenditures and the rest just shows as unallocated. Is that what the suggestion so is? It The budget would be for the full amount and okay. the, the projection would be for just the one year. And so for someone who anticipates spending the full amount, in the one year, the cumulative budget and the projection would align. Um, otherwise, we would have um, the one year projection and, and to your point, yes, like unallocated for the remainder of it. Um, we would know overall how they're project how they're planning to spend it. So the full disbursement, and then we would be able to see how much is essentially left over for year two, three or four. Um, and the reason why we were thinking of going this route is because we heard in some of the comments I forgot to mention in the grantee survey um, that it would be very difficult for an organization to plan out that far ahead. Um, we can have them do it, but that it would essentially, um, they wouldn't know how they anticipate spending things, especially regarding hiring and their plans in like year two or three, and how that then would potentially create additional work um, in terms of the budget modifications. So, so, what, is, so what does a projection mean? That I guess I'm just I, I really just trying to make sure I understand it. So the I there's a difference to me between I'm projecting that I'm gonna spend the money towards salary and benefits over this four-year period versus I'm telling you I'm spending the money this way for year one and the rest I'm not telling you how I plan to spend the money. Yeah, so the budget would be what comes um what will come to you for approval at the next meeting um yeah. with the full amount broken down by personnel non-personnel um the addition that we're exploring to potentially add is the projection just to get a sense if um, for those organizations that plan to not spend their full budget in year one so we can do the budget in four years, like a multi-year um, breakdown. Um, we Our proposal right now is to keep it cumulative, um, full budget, the projection just being to give staff a sense of what to then circle back to in the expenditure reports to compare against. Okay, maybe Danielle, Danielle might have a clarifying comment. I'm I'm still honestly a little bit lost, so. To say it another way, and Rocio, please correct me if this is incorrect, but my understanding is but what we mean by cumulative budget is they will need to report in the budget table, you know, with the budget line items, how they will spend um, the full amount, regardless of whether they're spending that in one year or four years. When we say it's cumulative, I believe what we mean by that is that we're not saying we will spend this part of that in year one, year two, year three, year four, but they still have to report how they will spend the full amount by line item, just not, Correct. there's not a column for each year, but there is still that budget table and they need to detail how they will be spending that full amount. So what they're, if they're not is, spending it in year one, it'll say I'm spending X amount on salaries, X amount on yeah. benefits, X amount by, by each of the, the budget categories, yes. even, even though there's, they're not intend, and then they're going to tell you, so they're going to budget it in year one, no matter if they're planning to spend it over four years. So by, they're not budgeting it in year one, because we're not asking what year they're budgeting it in. They're giving us a total project budget, if you will, a multi-year project budget. 
um, in that cumulative budget. And but then only for, but only for, but it's only, it's one budget for the, the full amount. Right. Yeah. And then how are you going to know which year that, how are you going to know what they intend to spend in year one then? That's that what the projection yeah. is for. So explain then the projection. I'm sorry to be dense about this, but no, no worries. This is this is happy to answer um, anything that's not clear. So the projection piece would essentially be the same budget worksheet, just specifying that it's for year one for 2024. And so for an organization who would plan, and please, Danielle, if I chime in, if there's a better way of saying this, um, if if an organization plans on spending the full award amount in 2024, that budget, the cumulative budget and their like year one projection would be identical. Um, otherwise, it would the projection would be a portion of the full budget because that's telling us that they do anticipate spending some in additional years and taking advantage of the additional flexibility that the commission is offering. Um, if it two years as approved now and potentially four years of staff is recommending. Okay, other other questions from others who may understand this better than I do. I don't want to take everyone's time. Angie. I'm not sure I understand it any better, but I think the possible scenario would be they get all their money. They have a the first year's budget. They're going to spend, I don't know, make up a number, 50000 Turns out that the attorney they want to hire, they have to get higher salary. So they pay them more the first year, but then they get a different attorney the second year they could spend less the second year on that same position. Is that a fair statement? Yeah, Am I making have, sense? I, I believe so. If I if, if I answered that correctly, yes, they would. Okay, so it offers the, the agency the flexibility to switch things around as life progresses through the four year span. Yeah, I I actually I actually like that and appreciate that. I I was just confused about it it sounds like I mean, I guess I would call the first document sort of the projection because it's for the entire amount. And then the other, the second document is really the budget for the first year. So in my head, that's how I would label them. Yeah. But it really is that the, from the bar's perspective, you're doing a projected expenditure in of all the money. And that's just called a projection, I think. And you know, that's called a budget. And then the one year actual budget is called the what are you projecting to spend in year one, right? Perfect. Yes. Mm. So how uh, do you, I, the, I, I had another piece sort of of the question. Please, sorry. They, yeah. they spend all their money in the first year, then they're not eligible to apply again for the till the end of the four year time. No. No, and those still. second allocation for 2025. Oh. Yeah. Oh, okay. A lot of flexibility. Yeah, I'm I'm a little concerned about the issue of having money that's not firmly committed, especially this many years out. I would like to hear Jeff Ball's projection. I've been on this committee where we've gone from fairly rich times in terms of IOLTA to practically no IOLTA because of shifts in, in the federal loan rate. And how do we know what the federal loan, loan rate is going to be four years from now? And what so are we doing with the program just, because they're, they're going to project, I need this money for a, an extra million dollars for increased salaries over the next four years, but they don't hire any increased staff because of, they can't find them for two of those years. And then you get to the third year and they say, well, we really want to spend this money not on salaries, but we want to spend it on infrastructure. We need to repave our parking lot or something. And is that going to be allowed? Or are we going to say, no, you've committed to personnel, it has to stay with personnel. And then what do we do when it comes to the year, end of year four, and they've only spent two thirds of what they said on salaries. What do we do with that third? Do they give that money back because we've already given it to them? And that would go through like our, currently our existing carryover budget modification process or what the rules committee will consider specifically for IOLTA. Um, so in, in that instance, let's say if they are at the end of the four year period, if, if the committee and commission approve that spend down, period, they would then either have to apply for or request, I'm sorry, a carryover that would then need to go through the existing thresholds and same with, with any budget modification. So if they were still changing between those lines, if they had initially committed to, let's say, personnel and were switching something, that would still go through our existing process where they, they would need to 
um, request those changes and go through the thresholds. And that's what we would be keeping an eye on as well um, year to year for those that continue to um, want that flexibility to spend down the 2024 disbursement over additional years. Danielle, I see you have your hand up. I don't know, if, since I know you're, you're on the working group for this in the rules committee, if you wanted to add anything. Yeah, and I apologize if I'm chiming in more than is appropriate, saying that this is not my agenda item. Um, but I, the only um, clarification I wanted to add or reiterate is that I don't believe we need to be concerned about the impact of um, interest rates in the future, because what the proposal is, is that this is the 2024 distribution that under normal circumstances they would get at one time and have one year to spend down. They're getting that same amount at one time, but then now they're having four years to spend it down. But it's still the money that they would have received and are receiving in 2024. They will still receive a 2025, 2026, 2027 IELTA distribution based on what the interest rates are at that time. Yeah, I it's think not... Jim's, Jim's question was actually a little bit different, which I want to okay. I guess I had two responses to. So when you're saying, here's our budget for four years, none of us actually know what the grant allocations will be in any of those years, but particularly, let's say, in year four. So Jim was, I think, expressing a concern that in year four, the allocation could be a very much lower amount which would sort of be a change in how you had initially projected the expenditure and was was what was, so I think your your answer sort of goes to the process for how those adjustments would be would be made, but maybe not to the worry about like, can you really adequately say people are projecting what they're going to do? Um, or budget, sorry, to use your term, because I think it's a projection, but it's a budget. But how you say you're going to spend your money four years from now, given the uncertainty with IOLTA. The only thing I will say is at the June commission meeting, I think it was June, Jeff, there was a different recommendation about this year's distribution that came from the committee that was looking at a reserve that Selena and I were on. It was a higher amount. And Jim persuaded, uh, Jeff persuaded the commission to use the most conservative projections, which in essence, uh, which resulted in there being less to distribute, but will increase, in my view, the amount that's available for distribution in 2025, because the interest rates have not yet gone down. They, in fact, went up at the most recent Fed meeting. So at least it seems to me for the first couple of years, we're not going to see the kind of precipitous decline, but I'm certainly not going to weigh in about what I think will happen in year four. So I think that's just, uh, you know, something the commission has to wrestle with this committee and say, are we okay with this four-year budget and a one-year projection of what you're spending knowing, as Danielle and Rocio have explained, that any changes to how you proposed in your initial budget to spend the money are going to have to come back to the staff or to the commission for approval. I'll just say using the current process. I mean, there's percentages that say if you're changing a line item, which is what, what I hear saying, like you've done your budget for four years, you've now projected for one. But if you're going to change your budget for year two and the expenditures are different than what you put in your budget, the staff have authority to approve a certain amount. And then after that, it has to go to the to the um, to the commission. And I, I guess my only related question with that is there's been a lot of work done about when do staff need to when does when do programs need to notify staff about potential budget changes, right? Because during the year, things sort of move back and forth. And, and while a program can approve up to 10%, if it's over that 10% amount, I think our staff now expect that you're going to get a request kind of, kind of more in real time than waiting to when the reports get to you, right? So is that still the expectation? And I mean, you're now changing the whole reporting basis to semi-annual, which is, I think, okay. But it, it, there's, I, I'm not sure people are clear. Programs are clear that anytime there's a 
more than 10% change in a budget line item that they're going to have to they're going to have to let you know although what equals 10% is in the budget because you're budgeting all the amount is going to result in many fewer budget changes going to you because the amount 10% of a million dollars is a lot mm -hmm. more than 10% of you know 250,000 right yes and on the grantee kind of understanding if this is approved um, staff either way does will plan just the increased distribution on um, providing additional instruction holding like a webinar with grantees and ensuring that it's understood that we can clarify any questions um, and, and definitely walk through the the hypotheticals and information and reiterate what the existing process and expectations are. Um, it, the other pieces won't have changed. It's again just the added flexibility of um, being able to spend down your the amount you're going to get in 2024 over a long period of time, and then just reducing um, the deadlines by a bit in terms of when you need to submit your quarterly expenditures. Yeah, but, but but I guess Rocio, just just so we're like I might be completely wrong, but if the budget is the four year budget, and and I'm not even saying I'm opposed to this, but I, I think mm -hmm. I think this group has to be clear about that. So if you are budgeting a million dollars for personnel because you can because that's your total amount, is the obligation to report changes based on the budget or on your one year projection because the, you're calling it a projection it's not a budget right and so that that actually makes a difference i think about when it makes a difference in the dollar amount because 10% of a million is different than 10% of 250 of when programs are obligated to report to you a change in their budget and you're not calling the one year document a budget you're calling it a projection and it would be um, the cumulative, the total award amount. So, so what the commission is doing is, I think, increasing the flexibility with the budget change proposal because the amounts in the actual budget will be much higher than um, and, and therefore allowing more flexibility than under the, if you're spending it on a, if they were, if it was based on a one-year budget, right? Correct. So just so people under, understand that the number of requests to modify the budget, if you're doing a four-year spend down are going to be fewer, at least in the first couple of years. Yeah, I think that's right. There will be fewer requests, and when we do receive them, it will probably be later in that four-year period. Um, right. Yeah. And Jim has a um, has his hand up, hand up so yeah. in case you weren't able to see that. A couple of comments. One to add on with Danielle, from from what I understand on our working group, what you didn't spend in year one would not be called a carryover to year two. It'd be called a rollover because it's within the four-year grant period. Carryovers are only for carrying money past the grant year period, right? That would be past the four years. That's one minor terminology issue. I'm uncomfortable with the four years, given our experience on the HP3, which were three-year grants, and some of the programs that had problems. We had one program that didn't spend any of their three-year grant in year one or year two, but we didn't get we didn't really catch it until year two. And we were able to hold back year two and year three funding because we hadn't given it to them as opposed to we had already given them three years of funding and now we had to claw back two years from them. So I'm a little worried about that because they're used to doing one year budgets on these things and now we're giving them four years. And now we're also saying in terms of the limits and how much you can change without staff review and what's discretionary is it's based on the total four year amount, not the projected year at a time amounts because that can be a big chunk of money and I'm just a little leery about being able to effectively monitor this given our experience with multi-year grants and the HP uh, funding cycles. Um, so, if I, I could just say okay, a couple of things ahead, about please. that. Um, um, so I, I definitely understand Jim's concern and I think one of the major distinctions between IELTA and EIF funding and more of those discretionary grants or even the formula grants, but for more specific uses like homelessness prevention, 
is that IL-10 EAF are really viewed as core funding for these organizations and they do have a lot of flexibility as to how they can apply that funding throughout their organization as long as it you know is still considered qualifying work and so I don't think that it would be likely to run into a situation where you just have an organization just not spending any of their their award um, early on um, and I think that that is a little bit part of the reason why we were proposing having sort of the one-year projection, even though the grantee is not beholden to their one-year projection, they would be beholden to the four-year total cumulative budget. It's to give both the grantee something to work against, you know, as an accountability measure, as well as to give staff an, an idea or an understanding of what their, um, their thought processes or their plans are for the use of the funds. And if they, they are deviating, even if it doesn't require a budget revision, you know, that we might be able to provide additional technical assistance or discussion with them about um, how they might adjust over the course of those four years um, if they don't think that they're um, able to spend it sort of as quickly as they need or would like to. So I think I think what Jim is asking is what is the commission's role with some oversight over the over the the four years, and so like I, I haven't thought a, a lot about this, but if you're doing what I call a one-year budget, but you're calling a projection, is there a way if the but if the projection, so for example, using Jim's example, if a grantee has more than, let's say, 25% of their one-year projection unspent, is there a mechanism in these guidelines by which the commission could be notified of that? And is there another threshold by which the, because right now it seems like the commission wouldn't get any information and wouldn't have, I this is what I hear Jim saying, the ability to take any action if, and, until the grantee got to, to year four. And so the, the question might be, has the staff thought about what might be appropriate commission oversight be in some intermediate benchmarks. And that's something we can um, think about in terms of the reporting piece and what at the end of the year one we can build in and definitely report back to the committee in terms of its ability um, or the commission's ability to, in, in this example, if an organization is given the flexibility of spending down up to four years and let's say for whatever reason is unable to spend half of its um, award after year one. Um, we could double check on if it's in the room, but I, I wouldn't see a mechanism in which the um, the commission would be able to potentially reduce its award given that it has the flexibility to um, to, to continue spending down, given that the budget, as you mentioned, um, Catherine, would be cumulative. And we would just be asking as guidance more and for us to be able to check against how they're spending annually, year to year, and, and gather information about what's happening um, and the challenges that they're facing. So I, I guess the question might be something like, if you if you had a situation where we're now starting year four and the grantee hadn't spent any money yet, how does that get handled? Because you're you're not, for example, going to be able to spend consistent with your budget most likely and spend like if 75% if of that was on kind of program costs or 50% of that on staff costs, how, how you know, like, anyway, I, I think those are the questions that yeah. the committee's asking about how, what, what is the committee's role and people taking seriously sort of the oversight responsibility that they have to make sure the money is spent mm -hmm. um, appropriately. And, and I think maybe some desire to have the guidelines reflect that the committee was in, you know, like there, there's some additional work to do to sort of think about some, some mechanisms to address maybe outlier issues. Mm -hmm. Because I think most programs will do fine. And you know, my organization used to, we used to have budgets that were essentially five-year projections so that we could keep track or a large organization of what our trends were and how we were spending it. And we came in pretty close. But you know, anyway, that that may, I, I think that's the the question. And and um I don't know that this actually answers or gets exactly at um 
the the concern here, Catherine, but um, just to to offer if in 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 an instance if if a grantee were in that four year fourth year of um, flexible flexibility to spend down the amount, if let's say getting towards the end of that year, we they if they request a carryover, I mean I think that's one question for the commission. Um, given that this is a one time flexibility, we're just talking about the 2024 disbursement, and then the committee or commission would be able to consider if they wanted to do something similar for 2025 or not. This is like one time um, specific to 2024 disbursement, whether um, it, it's up to four years, no carryovers past that, or if, you know, up, upon which point they would have to return funds and it would be redistributed via IOLTA um, for that following year. Um, or if, you know, we would follow if you'd be comfortable with allowing additional time past that four year flexibility. So I think that is one so question that we have um, that we would um, bring back to the committee or through rules, um, however appropriate, um, it, once, once we would, if hypothetically an organization gets to that point. Yeah, okay, so I, maybe I'm gonna be quiet and let other people kind of speak because I have one other question at the end, um, but Angie or uh, Louise, do you have comments or Jim, I guess Jim has another comment, so we'll take his and then look forward to hearing any comments you might have. Yeah, well, first of all, I'm, I'm glad to hear that this is a one-shot deal, that we're not thinking of doing this continually. Uh, that's good. But on the other hand, I'm still worried about this issue of not committing funds sooner than four years. Um, and I was wondering if Selena is still on the line, does she have any ideas on how the legislature might respond to this as far as stretching out the commitment of funds for four years? So, uh, and uh, Selena should certainly speak. This is not legislatively funded money. I mean, I I think the, the reason I worry about it is this is money generated from my Ulta accounts, which was designed to be spent, right, to meet the needs of low-income people. And, you know, it was set up as a result of a U.S. Supreme Court case. And I think that the risk is that if there are large amounts of money that remain unspent, that it raises a, a vulnerability around how the how that program might be viewed. And so that's why I guess I'm interested in thinking about just the commission's oversight role and the and the ability to sort of not let four four years worth of funds accumulate with without like a plan that's being implemented to spend them. So that that's my it's sort of similar to yours, Jim. It's just not like a I don't, I'm less worried about the legislature, maybe. Anyway, well, Angie and then Selena. Go ahead. Did you want to make another comment? Yeah, no. just a side note on that. At the last bank grants meeting, I was talking to Jeff Ball about this. My understanding that the rationale, the legal rationale in 1980s when IOLTA was passed was that you could not keep track of, it was too yes. labor intensive to keep track of small amounts of interest for multiple counts. And I was asking Jeff, given the change in computing capabilities, is it possible to keep track of those? And he says, oh yeah, definitely. That's not a technical infeasibility. So the large part of the rationale that we got IOL to begin with is no longer in play with the technology we have today. And I'm just worried that yes, this is not a legislature thing, but if we start accumulating large amounts of funds that are not being com committed right away, could this be relitigated because the technology is there to calculate the small-, the small I, I guess that's what I was, you and I would say the same thing. I just didn't say as much detail. So I think that's that's that is a a, a fair question to ask. So Angie and then Selena. I, I appreciate the concern about four years of money just kind of out there, but it occurs to me, uh, first of all, the staff does such a wonderful job of checking up on everything and making sure all the T's are crossed and the I's are dotted. And even so two things that you know there's Agencies are now supposed to report any disparities in their budgeting 10% or more as soon as they happen, one. Two, the forms that they're going to fill out on a semi-annual basis may or may not be exactly the ones they did on a quarterly. I think the staff could tweak them maybe to add some kind of reporting column that would help them and us 
figure out where all this excess money still is and how they plan to spend it, you know, every six months, something like that would come up, which would keep better tabs, hopefully. Okay, yeah, thanks, Angie. Selena? Yeah, and sorry, I'm not on screen because I'm getting ready to walk out the door to get to San Francisco uh, Bar Office. Um, yeah, to Jim's point earlier, I, I, um, you know, I know that State Bar staff have been surveying programs, and I think there's probably going to be some really great data in there about programs' ability to appropriately spend this down. Um, with the 2024 um, grant amount expected to be so much higher, I, you know, asking programs to spend that in one year would, would perhaps lend to almost everyone requesting a carryover request. So I think it's a really great idea to have this one time where we know it's such a huge increase um, to, to have a spend down that assumes that organizations who want to spend it appropriately and carefully and in a um, sustainable way will need a little bit more time to do that. Uh, otherwise, you know, a lot of organizations will not be able to spend that money in one year or perhaps even in two because they'll get new money in 2025. Um, yes. But I think the data from the state bar um, survey will probably be really helpful. Um, but I, th I think I share folks' concerns that four, year, four years feels like a long time. And so I would also advocate for um, more frequent updates from programs through their existing um, budget reports on, on plans if they are kind of behind what they thought they would be behind. So um, so thanks, thanks for that, Selena. Uh, I assume it's Jim in LA raising a hand. It's, it's Rocio this time. I just wanted to, to get in queue. Um, I just wanted to, to put out there, I don't know that this would necessarily get at some of the concerns, but again, reiterating that this is solely for the 2024 distribution. Um, the committee and commission has already approved a two-year spend down. And so if four years seems like too much, um, you know, the two-year has already been approved. You can consider a three-year. Um, so just wanted to, to put that out there that we were asked to explore um, up to a four year period. And this is the staff recommendation. It seems like grantees would appreciate as much flexibility as possible, but just wanted to offer that option as well, um, just in case that three to four year kind of jump made a difference in terms of um, how staff felt, I mean, how the commission felt. Um, and Melanie has her hand up. Look forward to your comments, Melanie. I just wanted to remind everybody that this is not an unusual situation in, in that we have the uh, HP3 grants that were similarly so large that we spread them out over time. And, um, and so we have experience. So just, you know, the staff and, and the commission have experience in monitoring and uh, assuring and even reallocating um, funds. So just wanted to. And th thanks, Melanie. And those were, were those three-year grants or four-year grants? Do you remember? They were four years. Three year, three year three multi-year year. grants. Yeah. So for that one, it was um disbursements also over the course of three years. Yes, but they only got one year at a time. Exactly. In terms of money. They didn't get three years of money. Mm -hmm. So that is a that big difference here. So I I guess I mean one thing, I guess what I what I raised at the at the beginning of I'm not opposed to multi-year grants. What I'm interested in is the commission or this committee getting information about what the expenditures look like and some recommendations about, so what, what can be done if a program hasn't spent their money at X period of time, right? And what kind of, what the technical assistance is gonna be. I, I do appreciate, we probably can't withhold the money, but um, I, I just think it, it requires some, I mean, I can hear my colleagues on outside of this committee on the commission itself who are really want to make sure there's adequate oversight. So I would feel more comfortable with this, these guidelines talking about, it, if nothing else, that you're all going to come back and recommend sort of mechanisms by which there can be additional reporting about the, um, the I guess it's the projections that is what you're calling it, right? And and the the appropriate role of the commission in reviewing and responding to those projections, something like that. And I'll leave it to others to say whether they think it should be three years or or four years. Is that doable, Rocio and Erica, or? 
Yes. The, uh, the decades, yes. So can we add something to the guidelines that would reflect that? So it's really additional reporting from programs about where they are and any changes to their projections, and then some additional staff thinking about the opportunities or responsibility that this committee and the commission would have for reviewing those and actions, if any, that they they could take if things seemed that you weren't headed in the right the right direction. Yes, I think um, you know, specifically on the re reporting piece, that's something we could bring back to the committee at its November meeting. Um, you know, I, I think the, the primary concern right now is obviously deciding sort of what budgeting will look like, but then in terms of um, compliance and reporting and providing additional guidance to the, the committee and the commission about actions you may take if you want to in, in the face of some of these concerns, that's something we could um, develop for the next meeting for sure. Do others have, have thoughts? Angie, does that does that work for you? You mean by adding something to the actual language we have on the screen or just in general? I, yes. I think it's the general sense. Like I, I hear staff say, like, this is about budgeting and what you're really asking about is the spend down, right? And so that they will come back. But we could at least report to the full commission that this recommendation also will involve this other activity for this committee relative to additional data collected about the projected spend down and um, ways in which the commission can, you know, and kind of ensure that the funds are being appropriately and timely spent, something like that. That's fine. Louise, is that good for you? Louise is nodding. Jim, how about you? Yeah. Okay. So I think, I think we have, I think, I think we then have an approach. So do you want to read the resolution? Sorry, I think you froze for a moment. Oh, um, sorry. I'm not sure if that happened or on your oh. end, but I couldn't hear anything. Sorry for the past. I'm sorry. I'm so sorry. <laughs> I was just saying, could you just read the resolution and then um, I think we can vote on it. Sure. Yeah. Um, so the original proposed resolution was resolved due to the significant increase in 2024 IELTA funds for distribution. The Eligibility and Budget Review Committee recommends that the Legal Services Trust Fund Commission approve a flexible four-year spending period for 2024 IELTA funds as well as a change to IELTA expenditure reporting from a quarterly basis to a semi-annual basis. Okay, any other comments about the resolution? And if not, is there a motion? I'll move. Is there a second? I'll second. Thank you, Louise. Um, do you want to take the roll, Erica? Um, a cloggy? Fight master? Yes. King? Yes. I'm sorry, King? Yes. Um, Klein? Meeker? With great reservation, yes. Uh, Vargas and Blakemore. Um, yes, and then at the, I'm hoping at the commission meeting when this is presented, you can, whichever staff is presenting it, can just reflect on the additional work that this committee intends to do um, in at its November meeting around the additional data relative to projections and some ideas about um, commission oversight of, of um, the funds. Is that doable? Perfect, thank you.
Okay, I think we are we at the end of our agenda on time even two minutes ahead. Okay, before we um before we leave, I just wanted to take a minute to acknowledge Jim Meeker and all of the work that he has um, done on behalf of the Trust Fund Commission. His term is um, ending, and um, I know him to be one of the hardest working commissioners. He's always reviewing grants and uh, engaged in monitoring visits and just really has been an exceptional um, commission member. And I'm grateful for his work and for the, the privilege of being work, uh, working with him. So thank you very much. Um, Thank you very much, Jim. Thanks, Katja. Appreciate it. Thank you. Okay. Anything else for today? Okay. If not, is there, do we need, a, I always forget, do we need a motion to adjourn? No. No. Okay. We are adjourned and you have an hour free until noon and then we are all back at it. Thanks so much for really excellent discussions today. Um, appreciate all of you. Take care. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks.